Uncertainty is gripping the world markets again, and with the fear trades starting to rise, there's a lot to discuss about what's happened in the past. Let's also talk about what's happening right now. Yes, the rally, the squeeze that happened on Friday. Can the party last? Was it real? Today, we discuss what we're thinking about these NASDAQ wicks, what we think about the S&P 500 coming back into the key supply zone, and of course, oil and gold, the two trades that tend to tell us a lot about what happens next. It's earnings week once again, and things are kicking off with massive volatility. Well, welcome back, everybody, to the special weekend edition of the Markets Around the World. Remember, we'll be covering stocks, commodities, and cryptos today. So if you like any of those markets, make sure to subscribe and hit that bell icon. So let's have a look at the week in review. What stocks did well? Well, it was all about technology and usually the stocks that drive us out from a bottom. At the same time, energy and staples were not doing so well. And the same thing actually happened on the Friday rally. Yes, it could be a dead cat bounce, but we've got more to discuss later on, even in light of everything that's been happening over the weekend. But remember, everybody, it is not just the week of inflation numbers. We've also got earnings results kicking off this Thursday and Friday, starting with, of course, airlines and banks. Make sure to stay on top of these and also make sure to be aware of the volatility expected for each stock. Take a look at some of these implied moves. Wells Fargo is coming in with a 6% plus expected move. Domino's is going at about 7 So it's sure to be a volatile week, not just in light of everything that's going on around the world. Now, if you notice my voice is a bit off, absolutely. I just got off a plane from the US and it was a fantastic trip. I want to say thank you to everyone in the community that I caught up with and also so many of you out there that sent me little tips and tricks of things to do throughout the US. I hope to get back there very, very soon. And of course, I'd love to meet even more of you. So thank you so much for making it an excellent, amazing experience. And of course, I'm very appreciative. At the same time, my voice might sound off. Yeah, I probably caught something on that plane. So it might be a little bit hard, but hopefully it still sounds okay. Market breadth readings, support oversold notions. Yes, look what's going on here. We've talked about breadth. We've talked about the percentage of stocks underneath the 20, underneath the 50, and underneath the 200. Well, when you put it in perspective of previous sell-offs since March, September last year, June, and March again, then you'll actually find that you were finding periods where you were looking for bottoms. We discussed this last week and we thought about how we may have just found a pivotal low in markets. Now, there are two important characteristics. If we take the lows of previous week, that is last week, Bears will absolutely get some serious selling. And I mean, like we're talking 4K, maybe even to threes again for the S&P 500. I think it's going to be pretty brutal. But for bulls, you really want to see that being the low. Let's talk about treasuries as well. Here's a great chart coming in from BOFA, and it shows us here oversold to the 200-day moving average. Very similar concepts, but take a look at this. Treasuries down in the October lows. Now, a lot of people are sick of saying, oh, bullish treasuries, bullish treasuries, but we actually found a level that many people out there weren't talking about. We've been discussing, of course, that kind of low 90 zone for a long time in the 88s. We went even lower really bringing in the squeeze pain. And we know that there are heavy shorts open. Once they unwind, once we see maybe some kind of QE come back into the markets, don't be on the sleeper for treasuries. I think it's going to be an interesting trade. But first up, we must find structure. Speaking of structure, bullish percent index. Just before we go into some of the dark pool activity and everything else that's been happening, have we seen a turn? Well, this tends to be a leading, or I mean lagging indicator generally for instant turns. But we start to see a little bit of green or a little bit of white here coming through for the bulls through the Thursday and Friday sessions. That's really the first time that's happened in all of this sell-off since that last dead cap bounce. We're looking for strong candles this week and, of course, a strong bullish percent index coming back. We will be on the lookout. And, of course, a lot of this has to do with swing trading setups. And we'll talk about the difference between trade trading, swing trading, and investing moving forward. What about the bears? Well, it turns out bears are back heavily, as we suspected the Tuesday read last week for how many people were bearish in the market increased to 41.6%. What was interesting though, is we actually had an increase in the amount of people that are going bullish as well. So I don't know, maybe people are getting pretty smart out there, but there's been a bit of a shift. Now we did end up turning bullish in the markets, but here's the bull slash bear spread. And we're looking at negative 10%. We've been much worse than this in the past in terms of some of the previous lows. 
If you take a look at March here, everyone was bearish and not many people bullish. Negative 30% was the spread between the difference. So we really do want to usually see everybody think the opposite way. At the moment, I would say, yes, there's more bears than bulls out there. And that's leading into, of course, at this stage, a bit of a relief rally. Does it make sense for relief rallies to occur at this point? Well, here is some of the data stats between 1950 and 2019. So these are the pre-election data stats. And you can see here that while we do tend to do okay through the trading days of the middle of October, there can be like a little late sell-off that gives us the rally. And it all comes down to what are the stats with 2023 and some of the past history points. Here are probably the closest points of the past history. That's when we had those kind of August, September negative periods. Now, we ended up getting a negative 6.56% read, which is actually higher than almost every one except for 1998. And you can see that when we had positive years to start off with, when we had August and September being negative, we generally had maybe a little bit of a shaky October, but November and December and October together led into positivity. Quarter four, 12 wins, zero losses. Now, of course, this is just a statistic, but of course it does really play into the bull's favor here and not the bears. And in pre-election years, we do need to remember this is where we expected that turn, somewhere at the end of September into the middle of October. And we may have just seen that low. In terms of S&P 500 forward PEs, things are um, not really, really low or really cheap. Usually you're looking for kind of like that 16.8. At the moment, we're trading between the 17.5 and 17.7 read. So where things are cheaper is, of course, the back end. The Magnificent 7, the big tech stocks, they're just not as cheap as they have been in the past. And that's something we are watching. For treasuries as well, something to keep in mind is everyone's been going bullish on them, even though there's bearish sentiment everywhere. We are looking for call interest to actually drop off. Remember, look at this. Do you know what this marks itself as? When literally treasuries couldn't manage to find any bullish trade whatsoever. When everyone's opening calls, that's unfortunate because it means that we can't turn. We are getting to some extreme points though, and I would expect a lot of people have gotten squeezed out. So as we start to get these numbers, we'll share them here on the channel with all of you. And that's for the Treasury's call interest, because if that reverses, bang, if we get structure on the markets, that could be incredibly important. A lot of people want our opinions on a lot of things right now. One of those, of course, what do we think about the jobs number? I'm not sure if this chart's exactly correct, but it illustrates something that is a problem in the markets right now. We're getting less full-time employees and more part-time gig kind of economies or multiple job holders. And that's helped to make that number look so strong. So another thing about these jobs numbers is they keep getting adjusted. I mean, it's ridiculous. We got 40K increase. I think that's like 12 of twelve of the last 12 non-farms or some ridiculous number like that. We're just seeing increased um, revision ups after the number came out. So why do we even bother looking at it? Well, the point is that often you expect the unexpected. I posted over on our Twitter X account, that we usually see a false move followed by a potential real move. In this case, the false move was the down. The real move was, of course, that incredible squeeze rally. And what was that rally coming through the markets? Well, it was, of course, a huge amount of basically shorts that went in early because they were fearful of that number. And then they just squeezed and squeezed and squeezed, closing close to the highs, which I think is still important, even though markets are opening up down here off the weekend news, which, of course, is terrible. Let's move over here to the markets themselves. Treasuries finding some large trades. Now, there's nothing new here, but we are starting to see structure creation. So some large treasuries trades, we'll be paying attention to those. And of course, we'll be looking for structure around these levels. At the same time, somebody bet on probably a bearish position on the Friday close. We see a large trade right at the close of the end of the day. I would say that might have even been an accumulation position. But anyway, if we see that kind of come back down and then close somewhere around this kind of 425 zone, I think, again, if you see more buyers starting to come back in, which we'll be following this week closely, we could be seeing a low for these markets for now. Okay, that's for now. So we'll discuss that later. Let's move over to options. Now, this is where we actually got that bullish inclination. It all had to do with puts. And we'll talk about maximum pain a little bit later on this week. Thanks to a lot of you that voted over on Twitter and X. Follow us in the links in the description down below. I've got to do a special on maximum pain because it looks like we're putting in what we call put walls, basically strong 
strong structural levels where markets will not want to move below. I'll give you a tip, 420 is one of these big zones in markets. But what we saw last week was an absolute smash of options. So many negative positions came in. And then what happened? We get that monstrous squeeze. Keep that in the back of your mind for the future. Have a look at this though, relative volume to 90-day average. I, is it, there's almost nothing here that wasn't up on the session. Look at these put volumes versus call volumes. Large trades going through the SPY, large trades going through the queues, large trades going through pretty much every one of the big tech stocks. And there wasn't anything that was, I think, standout here, but you can see the big trades coming in, even things like Rivian, Treasuries, et cetera. Look at those call volumes on the Treasuries, 371 to 170. You really want to see that switch towards tons of puts. Let's move down, almost 45 million. 45 million on a standard of 40, 53% calls, 47% puts. So still a lot of people go negative on the session, even though it ended so positive. But that was just huge volume. One of the biggest options trading days that we've seen in some time. Let's move over to what about rotation? Well, this is the thing. Generally speaking, when you see dead cat rallies or bounces or whatever you want to call it, fake rallies, basically, we tend to see usually some defensive stocks doing better. They weren't. Look at this. This is the one day here. Clean energy, solar, gold. Okay, maybe defensive, but gold, we've talked about how it's oversold. Semiconductors, technology. All of these stocks were doing well. Utilities did find a bit of a rebalance back up, but staples down low and healthcare in the middle. When we look at the last five days, it really becomes apparent that this bottoming effect is not necessarily led by defensives. Defensives haven't been doing well. Utilities, notably, has been horrible especially over the last 10 days. So we had tech, semis, communications, basically the three strongest sectors of the year, consumer discretionary not far behind, holding up through this bottoming effect potentially of the markets. That shows us that maybe it is the low. You know, it's very unusual to see this. What do you think in the comments down below though? Let us know and we'll be watching. And of course, we'll read some of those very, very soon. Thank you very much. Let's move over to the yields. Now, this is something that I don't think enough of us are discussing together. What about US two-year versus US 10-year? What's going on here? Well, we've got an uninversion coming on. Basically, we've all been talking about inversion. It's about to uninvert. This is the point when you start getting and questioning everything. Usually, it means and marks around six months to nine months away from an official recession being called. So, We've already seen the jobs numbers not really dropping, but we did see unemployment actually going up in some ways. We're seeing this gig economy job, DoorDash, Uber, who knows, I don't know, all that type of stuff happening. And at the same time, we're about to see uninversion of yields. This is when you need to start saying, hmm, okay, well, we might need to expect something very strange happening in 2024. And while I don't think it's happening in 2023, it will be something we need to discuss. So of course, uninversion, watch those yields. Let's also move over to central banks. What are these sneaky people been doing? Well, it looks like they injected. And, you know, they all claim, oh, we're not doing this, we're not doing that. But, you know, the proof's in the pudding. Take a look at this. A massive injection. We reported on this before we saw the squeeze. And all of a sudden, we get that huge rally. Now, we're at an important point, which we'll discuss later on. So it's still possible that markets will sell off more heavily. But there is a very critical point that will probably mark whether we've put the lows in for the year and we're going to see a multi-month rally or whether we're really going into a huge spike downwards. Some other things that are positive, of course, strength. So percentage of stocks above the 200-day moving average, not very good, 34.19%. We've also seen lows possibly forming here on percentage of stocks above the 50-day, back down to where you usually see a turn in the markets. The same for 20-day moving average back down into these lows. So we saw a lot of spiking, a lot of kind of fear coming into the markets, and that led to most of these moves. In fact, when you think about fear and you talk about the VIX, which we've been following, the VIX did manage to hit that 20 read. And of course, the VVIX and the move index, which is the bonds index, which we'll look at in a second, they were all on the up. Now, expect probably the VVIX to potentially spike a bit this week. We do have earnings coming up. But any of these reads somewhere around this 106, 110 level, they've tended to be kind of lows for markets. You can see here the March fear was a lot more, but we are looking for that. The one that everyone else has been watching has been the move index as well, which is, of course, bond volatility. And we may have seen that spike up to 140, which could have been the high. So bond volatility, it's hit higher points where we've seen more fear, but it is something that we are watching. And some of that's coming out. 
This is a chart that I think is underutilized. We'll discuss this later on in the week. And this is basically the S&P 500 versus commodities. Now, we do know that depending on what's going on here with commodities, we're expecting, of course, commodities to potentially outperform the S&P 500 for a few years. But look at this trend line. This marks so much, and we'll talk about it later on the week, so make sure to subscribe. But that trend line, look at the turn that we just saw in the last couple of days of trade. So very, very pivotal point there for markets. We'll move over now to the Dow Jones Transportation Average Index. We're looking for this to actually find a rally to show us that the markets might be in a low. This can often be a precursor. We used it recently to show us that there was probably some weakness coming into the markets that was real. You can see the top was July, then we saw August, then we saw it fall below in September. The rest of the market came with it. So what are some key points that we should be setting alerts for? Well, I think this market is somewhere around here that we should be setting alerts, these previous highs. So we should basically look for a 20 moving average breakout close because you can see that it's been using this 20 as a bit of a dynamic resistance on the way down and we want to make that new high. So Dow Jones transportation average, also something we're watching for swing traders to potentially say that the market low is in. Another one is home builders. Home builders have found possibly a double bottom. We've got some alerts here that we're looking at this week and we will be watching this one very closely. You can see it's been a pretty consistent downtrend now, and you can actually put a trend line through the top. So another one for us to watch, if we breach through these levels and then we take that, more than likely we have seen the low in markets, which is really what all of this is about now. Have we seen a low that's gonna give us a multi-month run, or are we seeing just a rally that's about to absolutely destroy the markets? I think the NASDAQ may hold the key to the biggest level that we need to be watching. What about corporate bonds? Corporate bonds continue to fall down, but actually they've been relatively speaking okay considering yields. Now you might look at this chart and say, what the hell are you talking about? But you gotta remember yields are actually up. So because yields are up way heavier than they were, are we seeing more fear in corporate bonds? The answer is quite simply, no, we're not. And we have to keep that into account when we're looking at the bonds market. LQD is not making new lows. So that's something that's maybe seen as a little bit of a positive. The fear in the market is nowhere near as much as it was, especially from the bonds traders, which is important here. The same kind of things happening with high yields. You can see that huge trade going through, but it managed to hold up above these previous weeks. So a lot to watch here on high yields. If they end up taking that orange line and closing below it this week, then maybe we have something to discuss from the bear side. And of course, I'm sure we'll see price action with that. Semiconductors, another one that everyone needs to be watching. We saw that low get taken. Semiconductors have then rallied back up. This was an excellent buy. We talked about how tech stocks were not making lower lows last week. And of course, that was leading us into believing that there was a rally coming with oversold uh, tendencies in the markets. I would say that from a semiconductor standpoint, there's a good chance that we want to make it back into this supply up here. And then the bulls and the bears will kind of fight it out. And that will make sense to the S&P 500, which we'll look at in just a few moments on this channel. So yeah, there's a lot going on here in the market internals and heaps to watch. Copper, another one, strong demand through the lows. We'll come back to this later, should we need to. Dollar index, this is one that everyone needs to be watching. Make sure to get your daily out, put the 20 moving average on it, set alerts for that. It does look like dollar possibly has put a high in, but we're looking for breaches underneath the 20 and also underneath this level here, which is 105.31 to confirm that swing trader kind of high that's been put in. There's a lot of negativity that's gone through this though. We had the switch up here, we discussed. We've had rallies back to this point. You can see one, two, three. This supply is marked too strong for it. If the market is able to close back above 10675, even though it wouldn't have made a new high yet, I actually think then it's ripping much higher. So look, we're not exactly sure that dollar is, is over yet, the dollar trade, but certainly it's showing those signs of weakness and we can put together a very good case if the markets go underneath the 20 and underneath that low that it is probably topped out for now. Take a look at the weekly as well. You can see that strong rejection wick. That means something, you know, someone sold heavily on the dollar over the last week. So it is an important point for it. Gold, that's going to rally off, of course, this uncertainty that's going on in the markets. Look, I'm not qualified to talk about what's going on in the world right now. I can just say it's horrible. And effectively, there are usually a couple of trades that people go to in these situations, especially where it is. You usually see gold spike up. 
Sometimes it doesn't hold perfectly, but usually gold, gold stocks tend to spike and we usually always see oil spike around these times. And that is what's happening. Uh, oil is up around 3.89%. We'll look at that very soon. But take a look at gold. Uh, it's rallied off those lows. So you can see here that this is that low, massively oversold, 20 moving average, super far behind it. You know, when you get something so oversold, it's basically capitulating. We take a look at the weekly, big strong wick coming off the top. And now we've got a bit of a gap. But this was a very significant switch, I think, that happened off non-farms. Really, really nice gold low being put in. And I could see that if markets do pull back, they're probably moving towards gold being long at this stage until we get up to it like 18, kind of, yeah, 1875-ish, I would say, for the uh, the metal itself. What about gold stocks? Uh, they continue to be completely oversold. We've discussed this before. Gold stocks are underperforming spot by a huge metric at this stage. And while it's sold off pretty aggressively, a lot of people would have had stop losses around here and they would have been wiped out last week. So, you know, with gold spot doing what it is, I'm kind of bullish here on gold stocks first time again after that one month of horror show that happened there. So yeah, we'll, we'll keep looking. Structure is important, but definitely small time structure uh, did happen. And now we're looking for like 20, what is this? Probably about 2760 on gold stocks and structure on the two hour and one hour on gold spot has happened. What about oil? Well, we kind of expected a rally, not in this way maybe, but we did expect a rally and nothing really has changed. I think oil will probably spike up to somewhere about 89 and then around this 89 area is where we would more than likely see some type of uh, selling to occur. And we've discussed this many times before. I still think that oil may have seen its top off. And while there is a lot of uh, no doubt and stability in the world, uh, we do need to trade what we see more than our own opinions, unfortunately. So here we get the long leg dojis. Here we have a level of concern for oil bulls and we'll see how the market reacts to it if it does get there. But it makes sense where it's buying. And of course, I do expect that rally to potentially continue to stick. Let's move over to Tesla. And Tesla has been finding strength. And it's, it's had some downgrades. I think someone downgraded it. Uh, but supposedly, there are a whole bunch of you know positive signs with the Cybertruck and everything else that's coming out. I'm not going to speak to the news too much. Let's look at the price action. We like 250. We've seen rallies off that. Again, it's kind of like the similar to the markets. The markets are finding rallies. They're finding strength. And Tesla is trading uh, you know, that way. Now, it did manage to fill the gap. You can see here, this is the short. Then it gapped. Then it came back up to this level. So if we grab like a fib out or something and we have a look at where it got to, it did get to the golden pocket. It has found some weakness off that level. Of course, I believe there are bears here. And if it's going to sell, this is the zone. So basically for Tesla traders, this is the zone. If you put in another bull close above here, I think we're going to a new high. And there's a lot at stake actually for this stock, I think just in the next one to two days of trade. So we'll be watching it very closely. Earnings coming up as well relatively soon for this stock. It's, you know, it's, it seems like earnings just ended, but we've got another one coming. What about Apple? Well, it has pretty good Octobers and we've been discussing that. So it's kind of like the market. We're coming back into that top supply level. 180 is the key zone. This is everything for the bulls and the bears at this stage. So I'm going to mark out 180.50. I'm going to set an alert. We do like what we've seen on the small time frame so far in terms of turns towards the bull end. So you've got that kind of bull rally. I could see sellers coming in anywhere between 178, 180, and then pushing it down. And then maybe we'll see like that recovery. But if we get through 180, I think that tells us the biggest stock in the world is finding those swing trade bulls. So swing trade bulls will be serious and that'll be a huge move for it. When we move to utilities, looks like we might have just posted the blow. We did discuss the idea. Uh, watch our previous video, jump over to the utility section somewhere about 10 minutes, I think, um, that basically when you get markets that sell off so aggressively, there's often a rally. Now, we only saw three data points other than this data point, but I think it was like 100% of the time in two weeks, we tended to see utilities post higher. And that does look like a double bottom at this stage. And of course, that is a relatively good sign that utilities are probably oversold themselves. And you, there's no, you can see why. Nextra and a few others. I mean, let's just put NEE on the chart so you guys can see it. Look at this thing. It's getting smashed. Oh, it's terrible. 
It's back down to 2020 lows. It got absolutely obliterated. And I would say that it is due for probably some <laughs> pickup because it's so far away from the 20. These are dangerous trades though, so you need to know what you're doing. And of course, practice risk management, make your own you know, ideas, assumptions, et cetera. So let's now take a look at the German indices and go through those. First up, we've got the German 40. And of course, this has been oversold pretty heavily. Effectively, this market uh, was moving towards that Wyckoff sell, which we talked about over here. And it moved down to 14,900, not quite getting that 14.8 that we were looking for and started to rally up. Would bears want to be concerned yet? I guess not. Swing traders will be looking at 15,500 to 15,600 when they switch their positions more towards the longs. And you can see why 20 moving average, supply, key res previous support becomes resistance. Everything kind of marks around that level. So I could see it kind of finding more relief rally as these markets you know, kind of work out and digest what everything that's going on over the weekend. Let's move over to the US 2000. Now for bulls, they're going to like that level quite a lot. It gapped down through the weekend futures trade. So basically we have this gap down kind of event. We've seen a few bottoming effects here on the Russell 2000. I think everybody's aware where the swing traders are going to come back in, which is going to be about that 1800 zone for the US 2000, that's going to be such a key point for swing trades and more importantly for the bottom to be in. And you look, you know, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to look at this chart and say we're at a key point. I mean, I think everybody knows that. If this zone is taken, if the bears manage to close below here, ooh, it's going to get brutal. I would expect VIX to spike, um, volatility to spike, moves to spike. Everything will be in capitulation zone and freaking out. So well worthwhile setting alerts below last lows. I think if we get these, we close below, it's going to be super significant and markets are really going to be freaking out. But you can see at this stage, it's kind of like a channel or a range-based pattern. So why wouldn't bulls be around here? Of course, they're going to be looking for it. Yeah, 1810 would be the zone that I would set an alert for for the bulls for swing trade. What about the Chinese market? Well, the Chinese market has had a little bit of recovery, 2.52%. Still a guess here at this stage, but I think everywhere in here is still defended partially by policy changes. And it's more of a, uh, a guess using you know kind of some common sense. Uh, but at the same time, uh, we haven't actually seen a technical change of trend or anything like that. So yeah, I've got an alert here at 36.70 just in case. If that happens, small time frame change of trend, but nothing big yet on the Chinese markets. Let's move over to the queues. Now, the queues managed to fill the gap. So that's been done. There's the gap. There's the fill. Nice. Uh, pretty strong base here for the queues. And of course, it was a decent turn. And again, they didn't make new lows while the S&P 500 was uh, testing those lows, et cetera, et cetera. So it shows us that the strongest market, which was tech, which is semis, was still very strong. So I think bulls will rejoice at the fact that what they've done over the last week was quite strong. When we look at the NASDAQ on the weekly futures, so let's have a look at the weekly futures, you can see those two massive wick rejections. Now, this is where this might be one of the most important charts to be watching right now. An alert set underneath 14,432. If that happens and we get a close, ooh, I think bears in very big control of this market. It's kind of rare to see the bears, the bulls lose these types of wicks without getting further recovery. So I would say at this stage, we're probably getting further recovery with drops being met by bull demand. At least that's what you'd usually think. Obviously, futures are freaking out at this stage, but that's that's the general kind of consensus. And you can see here, that's a very strong double wick rejection. When we move over to the market action through the Friday, it was a very strong trade. It managed to get above. Uh, everything's looked pretty good for a base. 15,000. 200 is the key for the next bear level. So I would say it looks more like this at this stage and then this supply being the question mark that everybody's looking for. Same type of thing on the S&P 500. When we look at the S&P 500, it's getting close into that really questionable zone. But notice I've got here a gap fill, 4,404. Now, this level marks where we got that kind of capitulation style selling that came through the fear that started to come back in the market. 4,400 is a psych level. So we know that's a big round number. And it's certainly something that we are watching very, very closely here on the charts. And as you go through it, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of people that will try to sell right in here again because of the previous supply uh, supports becoming resistance, the supplies becoming 
supply again. So obviously an issue here. And I could see that people will try to sell here. And I'm sure some of you would have sold the strength on the Friday action. When we look at the futures market though, it, it's the same kind of thing. You can see here, all of these subsequent sales are happening off the supply that is here. So 43.55 is going to be key again to allow bulls to push that 4,400 zone, 44 or whatever it was before on the uh, main SPX. And that will get us the gap fill. And also really, I think, decide whether this market's going bullish or bearish. I would say if we get through this zone though, it's likely the lows have been popped in. If the market sell right here right now and keep going down and we get underneath those NASDAQ lows and the S&P 500, well, I'm not even sure if we'll stop at 4,100 or 4,150 or any of these zones. I don't think it's going to go like this at this stage. I think it would be more likely just to go blurt, like, you know, down, kind of get into those 39s, freak everyone else out and then go up. But I would say the most likely scenario here is that we're actually starting to find a rally. And the reason is quite simple. We oversold. We found fear and there's just puts everywhere down in these 420 lows, these 4150s for the next two weeks. It really will come down to, of course, earnings. So make sure you're on top of that. The banks starting it off, that will be key. We'll discuss maximum pain later on this week, but I will say 420 is the key zone to look at. And of course, Bitcoin here, not that that's max pain, but I think that is a very big level where the markets will struggle to get any lower than that. And if we have a look at Bitcoin here, you can see Bitcoin's putting in itself a long leg doji at this stage. Strong weekly close though, showing us that again, Bitcoin is more towards the bull side than the bear side at this stage. And that's kind of what we've been saying for a little while now, as we found those lows here, as we found that rally. And it looks like it still wants to go towards, I think, 29 and a half to 30,000. That's where the bears sit at this stage. So yeah, the, the Bitcoin kind of train is just slowly grinding higher. Same kind of thing on Ethereum, although it has been a lot weaker than Bitcoin. So you can see Ethereum, if Bitcoin does find that rally, Ethereum is right at the most traded zone. So technically, if bulls are going to buy it, it's around here that they would be wanting to support. Let's have a look at the news for the week ahead. So we've got, uh, I think it's Columbus Day in the US. So that usually means the bonds market is closed. The stock market is open, lower, vol or lower volume usually on the session. Then we scroll through here. We got call PPI on, on Wednesday at 8.30 New York time. FOMC meeting minutes, always fun, 2 p.m. on Wednesday. And then the big one here is core CPI. So just before the, the release of the earnings results, we get the biggest bit of news, which is, of course, inflation numbers. And that's coming out 8.30 a.m. on Thursday, October the 12th. And then we have earnings kicking off on the same day, Thursday and Friday with the big banks, airlines, et cetera. There's so much to watch. Make sure to subscribe if you enjoyed today's content. I'll go try to rest up this voice. Hopefully it wasn't too bad for you, but uh, yeah, I'm certainly feeling it. Thanks so much, everyone. And bye for now. Catch up.